Father, we thank you for this day that you've made and for the privilege you've given us to be alive and to gather in this place and to discuss such issues with one another. Uh, we ask for your presence, your Holy Spirit to continue guiding us. Thank you for Jackie and the presentation she's made. We pray that these words shall not fall on uh, ground that is not going to be fruitful, but Lord, that you make our minds and our hearts fruitful. That after this conversation, out of this place there shall rise a generation that indeed shall take seriously your law, your word, your truth, and be willing to restore family and children, all raising up our children in the ways that they should. Give us grace even as we continue our conversation through this day. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, God Richards is the name. I'm married to Olga, and uh, we've been married, it will be 14 years, next April, 2008. Will it be 14 years, 15? Help me with the math. We are in an education conference, so <laughs> we shall do some math. Yeah, 2008 is when we got married, so it will be 14 years, I guess. And uh, we have four children between the ages of four and 13. Benel is 13, Genesis is 11, uh, Trinity is eight, and Robin is our four-year-old. And yes, none of them has ever been to school, but be educated for their age. I definitely say that after realizing I'm in a selfless, <laughs> because it's against the law of the land, not to school your child. But I'm always ready to argue with the lawyers that I think the framers of that law, they did not mean schooling them. They meant educating them. So it's against the law not to educate your child. But schooling, I'm not sure whether that's what they meant. And uh, it's scripture. The Bible talks about the letter kills. But what gives life? It's the law. I mean the spirit gives life. So every law, which is the letter, has a spirit that gives back to it. So when the framers of our constitution were framing the law, yes, they put down the letter of the law as we read it, compulsory education, but the spirit behind that was education, not schooling. There's a difference between schooling and education. So our children are educated much as they've never been to school. Uh, as well, I work, I, I coordinate a program that brings together families that have attempted, that are into educating their children from home. Uh, so we have a program we call Homeschoolers Uganda Group. And we, we are about, it has a membership of about 350 something parents today. Most of them within Kampala, Wakiso. A few from West Nile, Arua. We have a few in Kases, a few in Fort Potro, a few in Barara, and a few in Mbale. And we, what we do is basically to bring resources such as training to them. So we gather every three, four months and have a conference. Usually it's a day's conference like this. Both the parents and the children. Just to talk issues to do with what is it that they are doing, what are the challenges they go through, how can we be of help to one another, what resources do we have that we can share with each other. That's what we do with Homeschool as a gather group. But also I'm involved in the greater Christian education movement in the country, if we we'll call it that way, where we have a program where we train teachers in schools, Christian schools, especially on how to integrate their biblical worldview in what they do. And along those lines, we have developed a curriculum, a Ugandan, but Christian curriculum. In other words, one that follows the Ugandan syllabus, but biblically integrated. Uh, you talk about the four main teaching subjects, math, English, SST, what's the other one? And science. So four of those times, the seven classes, 28 textbooks, it's been a project we've been working on for the last three, four years. 
And uh, about two months ago, we had those books published. They are now available on market, whereby the child can work towards sitting your name, yes, but at the same time, whatever they are taught, they are given a mind of Christ, the one Jackie was talking about. So it's one of those things. Lord willing, we shall begin the O level, go to A level, so that when you talk about Christian education in our Ugandan context as well, there are resources available. Otherwise, this far, whoever talks about Christian education, I'll guarantee you the curriculum they use is American or British. In others, it's not bad, but you find these kids that know everything about Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. They know these 50 states of the United States, but they cannot name five countries in Africa. So we felt whatever the Americans have done to have a Christian curriculum, you can do it here as well. It's the same God, the same God who has been at work in the American history that God has been at work in our history. Just as he worked through the life of Trump, he's been at work in the life of Idi Amin. <laughs> I don't know whether it was good to compare those two. <laughs> but anyway, so that's, that's, that's the mandate we feel the Lord has put on our hearts, to see that Christian education education that is after the pattern of Christ, of the Word of God, is also available in our nation because I believe that's where the hope is. The hope for all the issues we're struggling with in our nation is in the gospel. And until that gospel has been brought to the people, there's no way they will become what we want them to become. Because all the problems, at the end of the day, if we try to track the root cause, it is, it, it is sin. Every problem is rooted in sin. And there is one solution for something called sin. It's the gospel. Whatever we try to do, it's window dressing. If it is not rooted in the gospel. As a politician, as an economist, as a farmer, name it. As long as it's not rooted in the gospel. We are wasting time, basically. And for me, that was the motivation for Christian education. I trained as a teacher, yes, but I hated it. When I was in high school, I did not want to be a teacher. You would not tell me you would be a teacher and I would come have a conversation with you. I wanted to do mass communication. Why? Back in the day, that's when FM radio stations had just come in the country. So we had heroes like mm, Rasta Road MC, I can tell how old you are if you don't know this <laughs> But in our days, those were the names. So every young man in high school wanted to be like them. People like this guy who just died recently, the one who used to be on Capitol. Alex Sindaola. Those were our mentors, so to speak. So because of that, radio stations, I mean, FM stations have just come. These are the people we listen to all the time. But like, yeah, I want to be like him. I want to be like him. So that was the reason for my wanting to do mass communication. There wasn't anything better, better than that. But, as the Lord will have it, I did not get the points to go to campus government sponsorship. They gave me education. And I say to people, I don't remember anything I studied in those three years. I was just there, finished get a paper, find a job, make some money, go back for mass communication. Still it didn't happen. The Lord had his way. So it is until he brought me to that place of recognizing that the root cause of every problem, you know we are living in a world where we are dealing with malfunctions. Everything you're doing, you're trying to fix malfunctions. Every career, every job, it's because they are malfunctions, all of which are rooted in sin. And if there is anything you're going to bring about that you say this is solution, within, do they call it a recipe also, when the pharmacists are mixing the medicine? Is it a recipe? What's it called? Is the medical <laughs> When you're collecting stuff, 
to make medicine. Yes, uh, compound. Okay. So within that compounding, if you do not inject in the gospel, or if it's not gospel circulated, you're wasting time because the diagnosis is sin. Are we together? Yes, so that's kind of the background for me. And uh, on this platform, I was asked to talk about why and how homeschooling and a few other questions that may arise out of that. And I want to draw your attention to why homeschooling, to Genesis chapter 2. We can start there. Verse 15. Through to 17. Genesis 2, 15 through to 17, it says in ESV, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, shall surely die. So this is God. He has created man and he has put him on earth. He has placed him here on earth. You can imagine being the first man on earth is a stranger to everything and is there by himself and God has not put him in the garden just to be there and have fun, but he's given him a task. He's telling him, he has put him in the garden to do some work, right? To work it and to do what? And to keep it. I think it was prudent again of the Lord not just to tell him, here you are, begin work. He had to give him instructions. How? Um, work and keep was the what which God gave him. But he had to follow it up with the how. And the how, and the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So man has been given a task here on earth where he has been brought and there are instructions that are following. There are commandments. God has followed the task with his word. Call it his truth. That this is how you will keep it. This is how you will work it. And in the commands God has given him, saying, the command he's given him, the instructions God has given him, they are composed of two things. They are do's, things man is going to do, and they are what? They are not. In others, he's given him guidelines, clear guidelines. You will go this far. And... Uh, He's not ended at just giving him the instructions so man has no excuse. He, has the, he knows what God is expecting him to do as he's walking through this earth, working it and keeping it. God has followed it up with the consequences. In case you don't follow my instructions, which I have given you, I've showed you how to live. Remember, you're a stranger here. I've just brought you here. And I've guided you on how you are to make it through. Please follow the instructions. If you don't, what will happen? It is so critical that it is death. Failure to follow the instructions, there is death. The mandate for education, we can draw it from this far. 
the commands, the instructions God was giving right there, he was educating Adam. He was giving him an education. He was teaching him. He was showing him the way on how Adam was to make it if he was to survive. And if he did not follow the education the Lord gave him, he was not going to survive. He was not going to make it. There was death coming. And I think for the Israelites who are reading these scriptures as almost culture, it's part of their life, everything, that's why they take education very, very serious. To the Jews, the word for education is the word hanak, H-A-N-A-K-H. It's a word picture for what happens in the labor world. I don't know how many of you have visited, apart from the ladies, the labor world. I've been there four times. It's a very, 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 it's a, it's a tough place to be. The four times I've been there, every time I go, I tell my wife, could this be the last? And she agrees with me when we've just come back. But after a few months, <laughs> especially when you come to a place where there are little babies like that one, she looks at them and then she whispers. <laughs> Don't you think we need another one? <laughs> and I comply. I hope four is enough, but I don't know. It's in the Lord's hands. But when you go to the labor world, the moment the baby has just come, babies are beautiful, right? And not at that moment. When they've just come out, they are all wrapped in stuff. Eh? So the word Hannah to the Hebrew, it is a word picture for what happens when the baby has just arrived. What midwives do they run to this part here to remove the stuff. Why? They do it so fast. Immediately the baby comes. There is so much activity at that moment. The midwife runs so fast to this part to remove all this stuff here to cause breathing so that this child can begin to breathe on their own. It is very critical that if it does not happen at that time, the child risks to die. The word for education, the word hanak to the Hebrew, that's the picture it brings. It's a matter of life and death. They don't play with it. You are not educated, you are as equal as somebody who is dead. But which education? It's the education in the way of the Lord. The way the Lord has showed them in his scriptures. And that's where we get our mandate as educators, especially as family men and family women, as families. God gave this family man, Adam, the mandate to educate, to instruct, because he instructed him, and he was also supposed to instruct his uh, household, as we are going to see. Failure for any man to offer instructions, guidance, uh, discipline, uh, call it inspiration. Failure to do that as any man, it's the reason for everything that has gone wrong in our society. We are ignorant. That's why we are where we are. We do not know any better. Why don't we know? The one who ought to make us know has possibly abandoned his place. Not that we don't want things that look better, not that what we are complaining about in our parliament is what we want, what we envisage, that's the best we know. And that's what has been given to us. So who to, do we blame? That one who was mandated with the task of educating us, of showing us the way. Who at the moment I want to call the family man? Which family man today has abdicated completely their responsibility to give instruction, guidance, educate? He's absent. He's not there. Parents are not available today for their children. I don't know where I was recently, and I was telling people about my story in high school. I was in the same school from senior one to senior six. I did not change. But nobody in the name of my mom or my dad ever showed up to this school. 
I was there for six years. And these people were like, what? They didn't come? So how did you make it? I also don't know. They would give me the money, I take it. I thank God that I managed to take it, apart from one year. <laughs> In S4. Find the final term. Because we're preparing for this for the S4 ball. So the school fees, I used it to also feel like others. Buy a suit, buy a big shoe, a shiny belt, pay for the party, and the disco to attend. And that's where the school fees went for that time. But I thank God they allowed me to do the UNEP, and I paid in back. But they didn't show up. At least they gave me the money. But how many? are not even giving the money. They are not doing anything. Actually, even those who are really caring so much, the best we do, I am not talking about those who are here. We take the child to school and we have their name registered and that's it. You don't even know who teaches your child. Leave alone what they teach them. What Jack is talking about that let's participate and help as parents and what have you, most of our society has been taught that as you, the moment you put the child to school, you wash your hands, you are done. So we don't know what to do. The person who was given the mandate to educate the generation, the next generation, thinks it is not their duty. They've abdicated it, so we don't know what to do. In other words, we end up becoming an ignorant society. That's why we are perishing. Because that's what the word of God says. My people perish. Lack of knowledge. So if people are ignorant, they are headed to destruction, to death, to perishing. We are seeing a culture that is perishing. A society that is perishing. Why? For lack of knowledge. Why? The man in whose hands the knowledge was placed has kept it. Let's just do a little statistics here. How many of you grew up in a home where your father was alive? Let us answer a follow-up question. How many of us grew up in that home, that father was alive, and that father used to teach you the word of God? Mine is down two. They've remained one, two, three, four. And put down. How many were up? Almost 20. They have remained four. So does it really? Do you wonder why we are an ignorant society? Do you wonder why we are going to perish? For lack of knowledge. Because this man, family man, who was given the mandate to educate his children, he has, she has read for us the I mean Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go when his old won't depart from it. She has read for us uh, Deuteronomy 6 7. Do you imagine Deuteronomy 6 7? Moses was speaking to a gathering of uh, uh, it was a, 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 a teacher's conference. No. These were families gathered together, and they are the ones who was telling the commandments of the Lord. Teach this law to your children. Another one, if you have time, which you can read is Psalm 78. Education all the way in the scripture is a responsibility that is squarely given to the parent, to the man, the family man. If you're led by the blind, be assured you fall in the ditch. So our parents did not know. And those who knew, for whatever reason, I don't know why they think they shouldn't open these scriptures to their children. And that's where education begins. Whether you're going to teach grammar, rhetoric, or logic, or math, arithmetic, name it, the foundation is here in the Word of God. That's where it begins. In other words, the least we can begin with as young men and young women, but young men who are here, please allow me to call you young men because I think God has blessed this church. It has younger men. Okay? 
Some of you are not yet having families, but when you get into families, please begin at least with the word of God. Make it a habit. You sit with your family every day, whether it's morning or evening, and open the scriptures and read them to them. Explain to the best of your ability. That opportunity to open the scriptures, we were sharing with somebody recently as well, and he was talking about, but where do you find the time to explain to children some of these things? Uh, we were talking about all kinds of things. And I was like, I think if you have the habit again of opening the scriptures, it will not look weird to tell your children, now come gather, we are going to talk about something. No. They know every day, either before we go to bed or in the morning before we do anything, we gather around the word of God and share it. And you can't, you can't imagine how many opportunities God will give you to address all kinds of issues that go on in life. That should be a culture that we need to restore as the next generation of family men. We need to, we have, by abandoning teaching our children, Beginning with the teaching them the word of God. We are that Adam who is ignoring the mandate God is giving him here in Genesis 2.15. What has he told him? The Lord took the man, put him in the garden of Eden. He has put you in your household to quack it and to keep it. And the Lord told him, you may surely eat. He gave him clear instructions. And if you don't follow those instructions... There is surely death coming. So if you're not instructing your children, please know it. You're destining them to perish, to death, to also walk in the walk of being ignorant, not knowing anything. Proverbs 1 7, Jackie gave us. I liked the last part of it and I pondered it and as a wow. It says, fools. It takes fools. It takes who? Fools to despise the instruction of the Lord. Say it that they are fools, those that despise the instructions of the Lord. They say it. Fools, those who despise the instruction of the Lord. Let's say it again. They are and point at them. Okay? You point at them at your risk. Is that what the proverb has said? Yes. We need not to take lightly the word of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord. He is true. We do ourselves a favor. This is his word, right? The hymn he says, this is my father's world. He knows the way it must operate. And if he has given us that instruction of how it should operate, am I not a fool when I despise him? The operating system, the way this world must work, is the way of the Lord. Because it's his word. This is my father's work. This is the Lord's work. Look at what he told Abraham. Genesis 18, 19. Genesis 18, 19. He tells Abraham... He talks of Abraham, and this is what he says, For I have chosen him, that he may command. Which other word can we use other than command? Instruct. Disciple. Discipline. Inspire. Train. Equip. Who? Who? His children and his household. Later I was, talked about, I was asked to share about something to do with 
family economics, if time allows us, we shall we'll draw it from that same context of household. His children and his household after him for what purpose? To keep the way of the Lord. How? By doing righteousness and justice. So that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. You know Abraham is a man of promises. He has so many promises he got from the Lord. Among those promises there is this one. Through you Abraham I will bless all nations of the earth. Uganda inclusive. And our blessing it is here at stake. If Abraham does not follow this mandate. Of instructing, commanding his household after keeping the way of the Lord. That's what is at stake. The blessing the Lord had promised him, including blessing for all nations of the earth. Through Abraham. Are you Abraham's seed? Seeds? In a way, we are connected to Abraham through Jesus Christ. We Christ likes. We who confess Christ. This should be for us as well. We are called upon to instruct, to command our children and our entire household after the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring that which he has promised. I'm trying to answer why homeschooling. It is that why, that's the reason. For me, that was the call. When I look at what is in scripture, the responsibility to educate a child is given to me as a dad to my kids. And as long as I'm alive, Lord willing, to the best of how he can enable me, I would love to be available and say, Lord, use me how you can in the lives of my children. But also it's beautiful that we are discussing this in the context of a church. Because when I say that, I do not rule out that there is a place for a school. My proposition for a school, it is only at this level, church-based schools. Where still the parents are responsible, but these parents can look out for other like-minded parents. And which better place can you find like-minded parents than here, where we have covenanted sort of to do life together? As a congregation, your children, my children, the other children, they are part of this church. They are our children as a family. And one of the call we have for them is to disciple them in the way of the Lord. So we can support those families, these families, our families. And that's what gives birth to what you call a church-based school. At this level, not state-run school whose doctrine comes from the United Nations. I believe education is a private enterprise. It doesn't belong to the state, but we can get there another time. The other scripture I want to write on, which will get us into the other question I was asked to talk about of how homeschooling. I'll write on Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, do not depart from it. I'm sorry for your camera. I don't know how to keep in one place. I'm now walking over to the white board. Okay? I want to draw that proverb. Can you draw it with me? Let's recite it again. What did he say? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So I want us to draw that scripture. So we train up this child in the way they should go, that when they are this old, Is that an old man? That when they are old,
They will not depart from First Proverbs 22 6. And you read it with me. Train up. So there are four questions I'm going to attempt to respond to in the remaining minutes. And these questions are critical in education. There is a question of who. Let's begin with what, who, how, and why. In other words, what are we to do according to that text? The answer is training. Who are we doing it for? Child. How are we doing it? Capital V way. Why are we doing it? not depart. So what are we doing training? There's a little difference between training and teaching, but it is. And for you to think quickly about training, I want you to go to the football pitch or soccer and think about what happens there, especially when the team is practicing, preparing for a, for a tournament. What goes on there? That can give us a picture of training. Training is not easy. Right? Training includes what? Exercise, drills. Training includes drills. And these drills at times they are painful. They are not pleasant. It's not what a player uh, admires. Most players, when they get to the pitch, you see them beginning to dribble with the ball, and the coach comes and says, put the ball down. For them, they want to be with the ball, and he tells them, put the ball down, because this is not time to be with the ball. It's time to kind of master certain muscles, certain skills. Are we together? Training is sweaty. It's messy. It's not as in I want us to have that picture even when we are talking about training the child. You want to capture the picture of training? Read Hebrews 12. It disciplines the muscles. And when in Hebrews 12, when the writer is talking about discipline, he says how it is unpleasant for the moment. But there is a joy of the fruit that will come at the end of it. No one likes discipline, but we need it. He talks about Jesus Christ himself de despising the cross because of what was lying ahead of him. So, when we are in the business of training our children, it is serious business. We are not playing games. There are no jokes. And sometimes some of the things that you're going to do are unpleasant. But please, hang in there, especially as a parent. Hang in there. Discipline. She was reading some of the proverbs that talk about discipline. And I, I wonder which version it was, which our brother was reading. And says, beat them up. <laughs> and they will not die. But beat them up. Is that what he's saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> beat them with a rod. Yeah. Man. Discipline is tough. And the, another one said, folly, foolishness, <coughs> is bound up in the heart of a child and a rod of correction drives it out. How many of you would say you enjoy spanking your child? It's not enjoyable. But it's actually something you might do out of obedience to the Lord. Training is tough. This is the hanak. There is so much we can talk about that, but let me leave it at that for now. And who are we training? The child. Now I want us to understand this child in four stages. Because yes, I'm training this child, 
but I'm training this child. Now, what you're doing to this one is not the same as what you do to this one, but it's all training. Now, I'll divide. Uh, Jackie uh, gave us the three stages, the grammar, logic, and rhetoric. A little bit can be related, but here I'll use different terms. I'll call this child infant from maybe back to about two years. And this is the one I'll call child from about two years to let's say 12. And this one I'll call him a youth for about 20 years, biblically speaking, but it could be 18 today. And this one is no longer a child, is what? An adult. And if the theologians allow me, I can use scriptures here to, to justify these different ages. We see Jesus as an infant in the Bible. The Bible talks about his infancy. In the womb, he's referred to as an infant. When he's newly born, he's referred to as an infant. By the time they come to Africa uh, to seek refuge, he's referred to as an infant. Do you remember when Jesus came to Africa? Huh? That voyage to Africa of our savior physically he has been on this soil does it not excite you guys jesus has never been to america <laughs> physically i'm sorry if you come from america but jesus has been in africa we should own him more sometimes i'm like guys you hear statements like the bible is a white man's religion i'm like where are you coming from is ours if we were to claim it even more. Jesus was here. Have you forgotten that? <laughs> he came when he was two. Actually, his foundational years. Two. Infantry. He was here. Then, I wonder which village they lived in. Was it Cairo? He drank the water from Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> two years. Now, the reason these two years don't, let's not be so dogmatic about two years, it's either plus or minus. But the principle of telling the difference in different stages is that a child, a sign of a child child, a child is somebody who is uh, there is a sense in which they are dependent. Dependent. How much? 100%. They begin when they are dependent, 100%. And as they are on this journey, they are walking towards what? Independence. Towards independence. The sign of an adult, which is the opposite of a child, they are independent. Are we together? Yes. So an infant is totally dependent. Like our friend there. What's her name? Habasa. I believe Habasa, if you placed, is it her? Him? Him. him. If you placed him like this, with the head facing this way. No, that head seems to be, it has started to shift. <laughs> but they begin by, they will be there. Wait, you take an hour, they will be there for now, until you come and change them. Where parents begin to panic is where she left her, him here and she finds him here. That is the time to begin panicking. You can no longer just leave him on the bed. He has begun to exercise some kind of independence. Before you know it, he's rolling, he's crawling, he's moving towards independence. I remember my son, the one who is four years, a couple of, maybe two years ago, who were walking downstairs from some building, and he kept pulling himself away from me. I, 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 want, I want to walk by myself. I want to walk by myself. The independence is growing. So when he begins to make some movements, there is now walking away from being an infant, is becoming a child. You can find this, those who are interested for references, there is a book called What the Bible Says About Child Training by Richard Fugate you find most of what I'm talking about here, these stages of child growth. So, from two and above up to 12, we call that a child, child, child. 
the independence has increased. There is more they can do by themselves. And as well, we can refer to Jesus. You know, after the incident when Jesus comes to Africa and they go back to Egypt, after, who is it that had died? Herod had died. They go back to Israel. The Bible goes so silent about Jesus' age. I've raised five-year-old, six-year-old, I have an eight-year-old, and sometimes I find myself in trouble with them. And I'm like, I wish they was where I could read when Jesus was eight. He did this. It's not there. It's so silent. Until when he's 12 years, then the Bible comes back to mention Jesus' age. Do you remember where he was? Passover, this international convention that used to be in Israel, where they would go, it, would, it was international because people would come from all over, including Africa. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? Was from that convention. And he met who? Philip Nethany. Philip and baptizes him and he comes back to Ethiopia with the gospel. The Ethiopian Christians up to now, the Coptic, they trace their origin back then. So, 12 years, he's, they've been to this big convention that had brought multitudes of people. As the parents are going back, they lose him. So, because they don't see him, they are wondering where is he. They look for him. Then they choose to go back as they are looking for him. It is saying that they went a three days journey. And then they meet him in the temple. A place, if you study these Bible backgrounds, they explain that culturally, Jesus, the people where he met them, uh, where Jesus was met, he was not supposed to be there if he was a child. He was not supposed to be there if he was a woman. The place would only bring men, according to their culture. A sign that at 12 years, most of the Jewish kids, boys, at that time they have been initiated into some form of manhood. You can now come and gather with men. And listen to them. At 12, Jesus had been initiated into manhood. You are no longer a child. You're not yet an adult. It's what we would call a youth. 12 years. 18 years. And if you read that passage, I like the way it ends. It says, The child became obedient to his parents from that time on. Is that what can be said about our teenagers? That they are obedient? Actually, I did education and in psychology, child psychology, characteristics of adolescents, number one, they are rebellious. So it's a given, according to the psychology they teach us. They are supposed to be rebellious. So we also expect it of them. Jesus was not. He became obedient at 12. And we see it traditionally. Many of the people who have done exploits, they did those things when they were in that, what we call the teen years. But our society is degenerating, expecting less of teenagers. The, those who are teenagers are the ones we think they will be, don't expect anything responsible from them. But that was not the case in the biblical times. I'm told of a story of uh, John Adams, was he the second president in America? He entered civil service the time he was sent to Europe as an envoy to represent his country when he was 17. Where are our 17 year olds today? What are they doing? TikTok. Pool <laughs> table. 12, you transit to now being a youth. And 20 is what was typically adopt. You read in Exodus, they talk about uh, if you're going to collect temple tax every 20 year old and above. Those who are being enrolled to go to war every 20 year old and above. Those different things, tasks to people when the, uh, Moses is taught to carry out a census every 20 year old and above. That was like their 18 years. So you're training up this child be mindful of what stage they are at. It may be the same thing you're teaching them the independence, but each you are teaching them to be independent accordingly. And independence, I need to take note here. 
This, as a child, you are in, you are dependent, 100 percent, and you are trained to become. But also, it is true, a child is independent, and we should be training them to become dependent. They are independent. They, they everything they want to do it their own way. But we want to teach them to become dependent on Christ. That you teach it. You don't want to live a life where they are their own child. Whatever they want is what they do. I want it. Let me do it. No. We, as we instruct them in the way of the Lord, we are dedicating them to Christ, actually, causing them to become more and more dependent on Him. That's where your hope should be, that by the time they get out of your nest, they become adults, they are at least independent of you. Yes, but they are dependent on Christ. That should be your goal. Shepherding the child's heart. That's another book I can recommend, uh, recommend for you. I can teach you that. So we've answered the what, who, then how. It's the way of the Lord. And that way of the Lord, simply, I'll summarize it into a read. And I'll use this triangle. That way of the Lord in scripture is I'll call it instruct them, give them instructions, inspire them, inspiration, inspiration, what's the spelling? And discipline them. At all stages you are doing these three, you are inspiring, you are instructing, you are disciplining. What do you instruct? By instructing you are putting heavy knowledge. You're putting knowledge in their heads. You put you are put knowledge here. By inspiration, you are putting understanding in their hearts. You are disciplining their hands with wisdom. So you can call it head, heart, hands. That's been a model most Christian educators have adopted. Instruct the head, inspire the heart, discipline the hands. We must do those three. I think they are what scripture refers to again in Proverbs when it talks about these three cousins. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom number one. Uh-huh. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Those three are like cousins. Wherever you see one, the other one is nearby. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Knowledge is focusing on the head, head knowledge. Uh, understanding is what focuses on the heart, inspiration, and the hands are what we discipline with wisdom. Why? Wisdom is what has been defined as uh, uh, applied knowledge, the hands-on, the practicality, the rhetoric, the grammar. This is what I will call the logic. Grammar, you're basically giving the rules, the knowledge, the foundations, the basics. The basic knowledge, facts. Inspiration, because the Bible tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but I think the legs also go, and the hands touch. In other words, it is what you full of that you express that comes out of you. That's why the heart part is important. And each of these, the question is how. Has a particular way. You have to be intentional to know that now I'm addressing the heart, I'm addressing the hands, I'm addressing the head. Head knowledge is what basically I'm doing. I'm rapping. I'm just giving instructions, knowledge, lecture, blah, blah. Give basic facts. Inspiration, you focus on the heart. And hearts speak to hearts. Life speaks to life. So if you want to inspire somebody, give them real life examples, do that. Uh, those who are in schools, that's what biographies do. Uh, real life stories of people who have lived a certain life. By the way, good and bad examples, they inspire. Things you can emulate. Emotions speak to the heart. I ask teachers when I do teacher trainings, when did you last cry in the class? They think it's the profession. But just imagine that lesson where the teacher even shed a tear. Will it ever get out of your heart? 
What moved the teacher to tears? The preacher at the time is crying. What's the difference? It's the same thing. If you really what you're speaking about is from the heart, there will be those cases. I'm not saying let's go and begin to put on tears in the class. But be yourself in others. Be yourself. I found myself in that place sometimes. When it is training, professional, you're training professionals. So, emotions, etc. There are so many things we can talk about that bring inspiration. You're talking about slavery in East Africa in the 1700s. And you, there is just one, one sentence, Dr. David Livingstone, who participated in the end of slavery in East Africa. There's a biography, full biography about Dr. David Livingstone. He's like, his birth, where he grew up from. How did he even decide I'm going to be a missionary? Back then, where there were no airplanes, where he would know I'm gone, and it may be the last time you have seen me in the jungle, real jungle. Leave alone people who say Africa is a jungle. It's no more. But back then, it was a real jungle. And this man came. People begin to say the flag followed the cross. Uh, no, no, there's a, some, some argument in history where they try to say uh, they can't be those people who are bringing the gospel because they, kept, they came carrying guns. What would you expect? He's going to meet lions. He's walking through the jungle. You want him to be with a stick. <laughs> so they had a gun and they had a Bible. And that is criticized. And they had a gun. How many people did they kill anyway? It is them who were killed instead, even with their guns. That can inspire you. I, there is a, a particular part in that biograph of Livingstone. He goes back to England and is giving a report. And he tells them, they were trying to tell him maybe he shouldn't come back, and say, until Africans end, I'm paraphrasing, they stop trade in humans and they begin to trade in commodities, I will not tarry. Doesn't that speak to a young man somewhere? Would it eat? It would. Other than this a small sentence, Livingstone ended the slavery in East Africa. Give real life that bring inspiration. Lastly, disciplining the hands. The definition of discipline, discipline, I define it basically as guided practice. Guided practice. You're teaching your child to write, hold their hands, show them how to write, and uh -huh, you write a standing stick, a sleeping stick, and then at some point you let go of their hand, they go by themselves. You are teaching them under guidance. If you've been to driving school, you remember the first time you got in the car? And they tell you that's the accelerator, this is the clutch, this is the brake. Okay, go to the accelerator, we are going now. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Press the accelerator. How did you go? <laughs> but the car didn't go anywhere. What happened? This man also has pedals on the other side. So you are being practicing but under someone else's guidance. That's discipline. Most times we think of spanking. No, it begins this way. Guided practice. There's a place for a spank, but that's not for today. <laughs> what, who, how, use this way. This is holistic. Where you address the head, the heart, and the hands. Discipline, inspire, and instruct. Lastly, why are we doing all of this? The phrase I capture in the past is so that they don't depart. Not to depart means so that there is a character that is formed. The word character, the Greek word, I don't, I've not studied Greek, but I've read it. The Greek word, I can't pronounce it, but the Greek word which is translated character in English is the same word for a statue. You know any statue in Kampala? The Independence Monument. You pass there yesterday. How, what is it doing now? <laughs> huh? Let me tell you, I was there yesterday and it was seated down. Yeah, it was seated. Maybe today it has stood up. I don't know. Do you believe me? No. That's not typical of statues. It is like this, lifting that chair. Come rain, come shine. Tear gas in Kampala, name it. It is here. Doesn't change character never changes. It's predictable. You can tell what it is. The same yesterday, today, and forever. A man of character, I gave him my money, and someone is saying how he could have stolen it. No, I know him. He's a man of 
character. That's where we are training them to. Which character? None other than the character of Christ. And it will not come by coincidence, but you have to be intentional by exposing them to the law of Christ, the word of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the way of Christ. That's what will form that character in them. I'll end because of time by saying this. The reason it is homeschooled, the reason I say it has to be private, it is not in the, in the, in the jurisdiction of any state to train character. It is not. There is no government in this world that is going to be responsible for training character. And when we talk about, about character, we've entered the realm of faith, religion. Which faith is the government going to teach? All governments have already put it in their laws, which that's what it should be, freedom of worship. We welcome everybody. So if you take your child to be educated by the state, which character is the state going to put in them? <clears throat> that's why the argument, education, being that it's a faith matter, it's a private enterprise. It could be homeschooling. People who feel the call and the ability to homeschool, they deserve to be supported and encouraged by programs like what we are setting up. But also those who cannot homeschool as such, we should, as churches, voluntary associations, people voluntarily coming together, because when it comes to matters of faith, it is voluntary, voluntarism. You can't force something, uh, a, some, something of faith to someone else. Amos 3, 3 says two can't walk together unless they've agreed. In others, you only walk on the basis of an agreement. And then in Corinthians somewhere it says, do not be equally yoked with non-believers, meaning be yoked with believers. So you see, belief is critical just like agreement is critical. Anything where we can work together, there must be an agreement. So when it comes to matters of faith, which education it has to do with faith, it has to do with character training. You who is going to teach my child, I must be sure we have an agreement here. We am not yoking with a non-believer. Are we together? That's the justification. There is more we can say why private, home-based, church-based education. I'll be welcoming questions. You saying something? Not really a question. Yes. But uh, the, the person bringing okay. bring the words is on his way. So you still have some bit of time to, if you can, okay. talk about home economics. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can see his change. Yeah? The person bring. <laughs> he used to be the person. <laughs> Sorry for the rocking. I rocked a bit there. But let me go back to Genesis to switch this into. He asked intentional about home economics. When we talked, that is something I mentioned because when we talk about homeschooling, I've said why and a bit of the how. The other thing most people, the most questions parents have is like, how, how do I do it? We are living in a society that has taught us, you know, we need to make ends meet. Mom and dad both wake up very early in the morning to go out there and work. So who will help me educate children? And truly, if you're going to homeschool, this is something went through with my wife, one of you at least needs to make a decision that you work from home will be home best. In others will be available for the children. But even that, I want to encourage that it's not, it's not the Sunday forever. Because as home educators, Jackie alluded to this, your success is not going to be by you placing yourself in a place that I'm going to teach my child all these 20 subjects. You can't. But the essence of education is not necessarily to teach the child what, but teach them how. 
When you teach them how to learn, they will take themselves further than you could ever imagine. So in that infantry stage, the childhood stage, those stages are stages for you to develop the how, to equip them with the how. And in teaching them the how, there are certain subjects that are critical that you can pay attention to, which every mother and father pretty much can be able to do. Focus on literacy. Focus on numeracy. Because everything else they will study is almost from that. Literacy. Teaching them to read, to write, to comprehend the vocabulary, uh, fluency, all those uh, literacy skills. You focus on those, you're setting them up on a path. I can speak from experience. Four children can be quite a lot. But as I speak, our focus is largely on the four-year-old. The thirteen-year-old, he pretty much is independent in his education. But of course you have to be available here and there on a few things. But he's independent. He's an independent learner. He can read, he can write, he can comprehend, he can reason, he's into the logic stage. Now he can make analysis, but those are things we've spent time on teaching him how to use it, consult a dictionary, consult, talk to people, all those skills. How do you take notes? Different things now, he's good at that. The 11 year old, the same. The 8 year old, we are still giving some time, but many times he's the one who is pushing us away. The 8 year old, he says, I can do it, I can do it, and you come in and you sneak in to make sure, really, he says he can do it, can he? And the four-year-old, because it's everything is foundational now, is the one who we are spending much time with. So by teaching them how to learn, other than what you learn, you're preparing them. That's an encouragement that even when you are saying, stay home, work from home, because staying home again does not mean that you can't work. There's so much that we can do from home. So I just wanted to say that first and foremost. But that does not mean we are not concerned about the making ends meet. But even the making ends meet, that's where comes in this concept of family economics. What is the text we began with? It was Genesis 2, 15, 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and... To keep it. God gave man a garden to work. He gave him a business. Gave him an economy. And then he commanded him saying, this is how you do it. Then we read Genesis 18, 19. This is, as far as Abraham is concerned, the Lord said, for I have chosen him, Abraham, that he may command his children and his household. The word household, the Greek word is oikonomia. It's the same word from which the English or whoever came up with the word economics. Economics, many times today when we think of economics, we think government, kasaija, national budget. We are only at that level. But oikonomia is basic household law. Every family is an economy of its own and it should be nurtured and stewarded as an economy. And every family, God has given it a garden of Eden, an economy of their own that they should nurture. The world, of course, has taught us that we are going to invest all our energy, our talents, our gifts and resources in the corporate world, someone else's economy out there. So we wake up every day in Kampala, 5 a.m., in traffic jam. I don't know what time we arrive at the places of work. We are burnt fuel. Then we reach late. It is said we are supposed to invest in eight hours, but many people start at 11 to do something tangible. At one, they go for lunch break. 
at, at four they are already panicking because they want to beat traffic jam, go pick the children, get to them in the car so that you get in the traffic again to go back home. Then they reach home 9 p.m. The children have homework from school. By the time they are done with homework, they are dead, asleep. At five, they must be awake. Get in the car again. The routine continues. COVID taught us something. Some people realize actually it's possible to work from home. It's possible. Even when you work for the corporate world, there are people who are wondering, really, do you have to wake up and go somewhere? You have your computer. Everything you do, you deliver on computer. Why don't you work from home? Then when you clock, is it 55 these days? 65. Which time? 65, 60. 60. They tell you now, go back home. Now that's when most people begin to think of investing in a family business. I've tried a bit to do a bit of business. It equally requires energy, effort, skills, knowledge. It's not a place to lay, to come and just retire and be at leisure. No. And I'm reminded of some scripture. A righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children and children's children. That work in the corporate world, you will not put it in your will for your children. When the time comes to go, they will just tell you to actually, before you're buried, the artifact will be in the papers. <laughs> when it comes to economics, just like education, is a responsibility given to the family. I believe even economics or economia was given to the family. I'll go to the board again. Ah, was this permanent? I think you can see what I've erased and you see what is new. I'll use blue, focus on this triangle here. There are these three institutions, the family, the church, and the state. They are both, they are all three of them are God ordained. I want to find the best way of being fast with this. There is givings that happen. We give to the church, right? What do we give to the church? We give money to the church. What do we call that money? We tithe. Tithe and offerings. There is also money that we give to the state. What is that called? We give taxes. Is there money that the church gives to the state? Or should? Which one? It's not there. What's it called? Shouldn't. Those are abuses that are coming up. Neither the state giving. No. Why? Why the one is receiving from <laughs> from famine? When you look at it naturally, and even the way God, the pattern God has established in Scripture, He gave to Adam, to the family man, a garden of Eden, He gave him an economy. He gave him the garden, the land, He gave him factors of production. This one is the one who is involved in enterprises. He raises resources, is productive, was given the great commission. Be fruitful. There is fruitfulness. Multiplication. To fill the earth and subdue it. The children of Israel, the tribes of Israel, one tribe was not apportioned land. You remember? 
Which tribe was that? The Levites. They are here. And they are mandated to receive 100% from what comes. To receive from that. Because they don't have anything that was apportioned to them. Education is here. Business is here. Even education is a business, it's an enterprise. For me, I was not given land, I was given education. It's what I run as my family economy. Education is not a free good. It's labor. I produce educational materials. So for someone to say that they are free, you are abusing my labor. A worker deserves their pay. Education is not a free good. Okay, let's say government is providing education. Where does it get it from? As a, com a commodity or a service. Where does it get it from? No, oh, taxes is money. Education is knowledge. Skills, what I'm giving now. Did I get it from the national treasure? <laughs> Education is a private and service. It's a private enterprise that people arrange, organize, and put together, and they should they have the freedom to offer it to those who they have chosen to associate with at an understanding. Everything business is here. That's where our economy, family economy, household happens. Then from the abundance of what we've made, we give tithes and offerings to who? First of all, if I live here, what we make from here is for what purpose? To take care of you and your household and your family. And every man must be able to take care of his household and his family. To the extent that the Bible says if you can't, you are worse than an infidel. Are we together? But in taking care of our family, we need not to forget there are people who do not have family. Are we together? The orphans, the widows, and the aliens. The Bible uses those examples. Why? An orphan is somebody who has lost family. So he has no livelihood. He has no factors of production. A widow the same. Their livelihood was tied to their family. Especially if the husband died. Aliens. People who are not in their country. Where are you from? US. US. UK. Where? UK. UK. Do you have land here? <laughs> These people, according to scripture, they must be in our care. They are aliens. <laughs> he cannot say let him go and grow potatoes there. He has no place to grow potatoes from. For you, you can. And how do we take care of them as the aliens? They are not my responsibility because I have my responsibility in my family. They are our responsibility. Where we come together collectively as we bring together each one bringing their tithe and offerings. Collectively we shall be able to take care of the orphans, the widows and the aliens. Many times you want to think of aliens as only refugees from South Sudan. Whoever, the day God will put you in a country which is not your own, is the day you will feel that you are indeed vulnerable in case of anything. When COVID hit here and everyone was locked down, no one is moving, the airwaves were all free, no flights, no nothing, the first people to think about there is when you are not in your country. What do I do? I'm not home. Because when you're at home, even if you don't have food, there is a security you feel. But not being at home, you deserve to be protected.
to be kept, to be provided for, to be safe. That's what you're looking for. For us now, if you see these guys in uniforms running around and tear gas and what have you, you quickly know where to run to, right? It may be difficult to know where even to go. That's why the Lord is so concerned about orphans, widows, and aliens. And he gives them family. He says God himself that I'm the father to the fathers, the husband of widows. He's our refuge. Right? Yes. And he does that through his body, the church. How? Tithes and offerings. Including education. People who cannot, be, I'm talking about homeschooling or uh, coming together as families and we are responsible for the education of our children. Those who don't have family, which will educate them, we come together through tithes and offerings, we set up a church school. And that's where we can even bring our own children so that the orphan children are not isolated to feel like, oh, we poor orphans are in a church school. No. The, we, that school can be for all of our children together, so that these orphan children also are provided for family here at church level. That's the place for schools, and that's how schools began. I won't take you through the history of, uh, of education, even in Uganda. There is a famous name in the history of education. It's called the Felix Stock Commission. That commission is what made education become a government education. But why Felix Stock? Felix Stock was American, and where he came from, he has set up a farm. He was a philanthropist, and that's a fund. And the fund was to take care of the orphaned children back then in America who were not educated from their homes, who had no family to educate them. That's the place for school. I want to come to, yes, family economics. I'm trying to justify why it should be that. Taxes, why do we give taxes? You can reason this from a number of places, even in scripture, Romans 13. I limit the job of the government to three things. Protect, defense, and punish. Government should stay at those three, using the, the tool that they were given, the sword. Protect life, property, and people's abilities and freedom to do the enterprises God has called them to defend the same life, uh, property, and people's freedoms, but also punish those who abuse them. Using the sword, Romans 13, they don't hold it in vain. This one has the sword, uh, in his sword, this one has a sword, the sword of the spirit. It's what he uses. This one has a sword also, the rod of correction. So when you look at whatever each one was given, that's what they should do, and they should limit themselves to that. What we call abuse of office is when the state begins to do what it should be done by the family or doing what it should be done by the church. The way it happened in COVID. COVID has hit, it's time for people to be supported and helped. The church is beginning to mobilize to give people food, and someone announces no one should give anything. Everything should come to the state. I wrote an article around that time to provoke people, and I said, now that the government collects both taxes and tithe, we should stop giving tithes to church. It was just to provoke people. Because if you say governments, they want to give charity now, they should receive the tithes as well. And that's what is happening sometimes, that's what we see. This doing what should be for this one, just like I spank my child when they go out of line, but I will not take them to jail. I'm not the one to take them to jail. When they are 18, a spank is not enough. There are issues where the state will come for them with a sword, and they should know that. Church, I don't think, I don't know what your pastor does, I don't know, but I've had some churches where the pastor puts you down and begins to some spank. <laughs> because you are caught in immorality. <laughs> Church doesn't use the rod. It uses the sword of the spirit. 
in every form of discipline. Kaihura uses the sword, the real sword. Be careful. Don't play with him. So if we come back to each sphere operating the way it should be, I think to some degree we can see family economies revived. If the thinking changes and we begin to realize that actually every family is an economy and it should grow and this family economy is my family economy can choose to combine with yours and we form a company with yours and we form a company and it grows bigger and bigger. Have you ever noticed the big companies that we hire to build our roads here? It is as if a government of Uganda is partnering with the government of China. No. Sometimes some of those projects, they partner with a private company there, family economy there, and it does the work for a government here. So why shouldn't my family also grow its economy and operate in that so that we may have earn a living but also have something to share with those who are needed. Ephesians 4.28. Isn't that what he says? Let the thief stop stealing but let them labor with their own hands so that they may have what they can share with the needed. How will you have what to share with the needed if you do not labor with your own hands, private hands, Robbing us of the ability to labor with our hands is one of the things that is causing families to be broken. Families cannot be what they should be. We are not educating our children. We are not doing any family economy. No wonder we are in the place we are in as families. We can't give to church because we don't have. We are not, our hands are tied. I see food has come. Any quick question? But that's the idea, just wrap through it of family economics. We have those kinds of teaching we do to young people but also to families. To encourage them that you can do startups, you can do different things as a family. Yes, there are different hindrances sometimes here and there in registering things. But it's something, just like education, homeschooling itself is not necessarily something legal per se. But at the same time, it is not illegal. All these things we need to just figure out. How do we restore them to the best of our understanding if that's where scripture is leading us? Yes, sir. Uh, what, what, what's your idea of a family business? Do you have any business in mind? It can be anything. Look at yourself. What is it that the Lord has gifted you with? Look at the parable of talents. Everyone, there is something God has given, and He will ask you to give accountability of what He gave you, not what He did not give you. That's why I talk about education. I think I'm a teacher. That's what I think I can invest in, whatever I'm doing. I don't know what you are, but any idea God has given you, any giftings God has given you, there is a post, you can turn that into a family economy. Land. Has he given you a piece of land? How much have you utilized it? Has he given you connections or people you know, or contacts or certain skills or certain giftings? What do you do with them? We will be held accountable for what we did and what we did not do with what God gave us. Nobody can say, I have nothing. God has given us all something that we can turn around to be productive, to be fruitful, to fulfill the dominion mandate, be fruit, fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. That's the, the call we all have. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Do you hold uh, workshops or to, to help parents prepare to do homeschooling, raise up their children the way we proceed. It is here. <laughs> <laughs> we have come for a workshop. Regularly. regularly yes, we do teacher. that in other words, yeah. Lastly, that's what Marvin says. Uh, you brought that issue of uh, parents 
working, but at the same time the students are so the, the children are engaged with school. Yeah. So we realize that whatever we have discussed needs more time between the kids and their parents. Mm -hmm. And yet there is no way you can have that if you don't have that time. Yeah. So what can you say in order to if you don't have time? Yeah, because now if every day you are going to work, yeah. Okay, and remember the kids attend they are either in coding yeah. because they are engaged in school. Yeah. So what can you say to have that balance? I think we all have 24 hours a day. Sudil has 24 hours a day. You have 24 hours a day. Even the beg on the street has 24 hours a day. The difference is what are you going to do with us with that time? Prioritize, especially as early as possible. You can choose that I will live this life, I will not live this life. It's a choice. My wife and I, we chose to homeschool before we had a child. And we decided one of us will be home based before we had a child. She has a degree from Makere, literature in English. And that was a big argument from her parents. But that's, the, that's what she chose, and with family. So there are sacrifices to make and priorities to say, this is the way I will go. That's what I can say. But lastly, on the issue of uh, family economy and education. Education is not only to acquire book knowledge. If you have an economy goal, your children have an opportunity to be engaged in the same. And that's better education, where they have an opportunity to work. This thing where we are in books 24-7 is part of what is killing us. Our nation is 51% below the age of 15, 78% below the age of 30, and all those people, if you looked for where they are, they are in schools doing nothing but books. So if 78% of the country's population is doing books, who is working to, su to sustain this nation, this economy? 22%, without counting the elder. It could even be less. We need to tap into that generation. The time when I felt I can tear a lion was when I was in my teens. But we waste that energy doing nothing but books. Not far. In Zambia, schools go to, uh, kids go to school three hours a day. Then you go home, do other things. There is another company told me they do it six hours a day. Go home, do other things. There are jobs in this country that don't are not supposed to be for people like you. Let's leave them to the teenagers. Car washing, washing base. If these teenagers went to school certain hours, a dozen hours, they are in the car washers washing cars every car fifteen thousand. Would the government claim we are paying education for children at seven? Uh, 7,000 Uganda shillings for a year. Do you know that's the UPE money that goes to school? 7,000, we are talking about $2 a year. That's the tax we pay to take care of public school. Those kids can make that money. And you don't, they don't bother government, they don't bother parents. If that's what it takes to get education. We are raising a generation that is not equipped to work with their hands. They know one thing, books. They finish, they graduate, the speeches go like this. You have just started. <laughs> you need a master's. On the master's as you graduate, you need a PhD. So when will you practice what you are told? This triangle ends in discipline. Discipline is hands-on work. So having family economy will give children opportunities to get involved in work at home, to work in the family farm, to work in the chickens, to wash. My car ended a long time ago to take it to a washing bay. That's my kids' project. And I pay them that 10000 every time they wash. Each of the children has a business. One washes my car. The girl, her job, she does the cleaning of our office. 
and she goes to the accountant and he cashes the money to her every end of month. Every week, twice, she goes to the office and does the mopping and the cleaning. She's on the payroll. 20000 per month for an 11-year-old. That is something. Another one, we, 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 we was raising chickens and they had the, the eggs. And every, we decided all the eggs we eat at home, we don't get from the supermarket, from his chickens. And he's given his money. Why am I doing that? Teaching them to work, to be involved in work. The boy loves to build. He builds stuff with Legos. So I was like, instead of working with Legos, when there's real cement and bricks. So what we did, I got a, a contractor, some guy who builds houses. He allowed me every month, we get one day, we go spend half a day at his sites. It began by just observing. Then they started giving him the hammer and the tools. So he goes and they tell him, do this, do this, and he works. And he comes back so proud he has been building something. Why am I doing that? I just want to begin orienting him in the world of work. Family devotions, we do all kinds of things. Read the scriptures, read the catechism. But sometimes we pick a book on business and walk through that. Well, even while they are still young. Because I realize business is a gift God has given us as believers. We need to use it. Thank you very much.